Hi, this is Ed Rudiger, and I am absolutely delighted you're tuning in to hear another one of my sermons. Now, I'm preaching this one in my church in Sligo, Pennsylvania. Now, Sligo is a little town in northwestern Pennsylvania. It's 10 miles south of Clarion, and Clarion is right on Interstate 80. And my church is Sligo Presbyterian Church. And I'm preaching this sermon as part of a series we've been in throughout the summer. So, brothers and sisters, hear the word of God. If you remember, last week I started the sermon by saying that Debbie and Maggie weren't here in Sligo. They were spending some time visiting family and friends in Indianapolis. Well, as the little girl said in the movie Poltergeist 2, they're back. But I've got to tell you, unlike the family in the movie, this actually makes Coco and I really happy. And you know, if I'm completely honest, and understand I say this because she's not here, even though I certainly miss Debbie when she's gone, it's particularly nice to have Maggie home. Because it doesn't happen all that often. Not since she's gone off to college. But I guess that that's what makes the time she's around really especially special. But of course, whenever she's with us, I find myself remembering some of the things from the past. You know, when she was growing up. And I'm talking about both the good and the bad. I mean, I end up thinking about all those wonderful times we had playing Windy Woo, Homecoming Warrior, and listing both the presidents and the vice presidents in order. We used to do that stuff. But I also remember the not so good. Like when I got a call after she fell on the concrete stairs outside the school and broke her nose. Or when she had her first fender bender as she was leaving We're High and didn't look both ways. Now, those are some of the things I remember. And even though they're always around, rattling around up here, when she's gone, those memories sort of move from the back to the front. And it's at those times I realize how profoundly I've been changed by just having her in my life for these 21 years. And I'm mentioning this because we're going to be talking about that same kind of thing, that same kind of change this morning. You know, as we look at the story of how Jacob became Israel. Of course, as most of you all know, this is the ninth message in this series I entitled The Patriarchs, Encountering the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And to this point, we've looked at a bunch of stories about God and Abraham, and then a couple about God and Isaac. And this morning, we're going to look at the last story dealing with God and Jacob, one in which he encounters the Lord in a way that's extremely up close and personal. And then leaves this encounter to change man in two very important ways. Now, that's the story. And as we've done before, we're going to look at what happened and then we're going to apply it to ourselves. And hopefully by the end, we'll have a better idea about how we might encounter God and how that encounter can also change us. Of course, to reach that point, we really need to get a handle on the story itself. And to do that, we need a little bit of background. I mean, picking up where we left off last week, you know, when Jacob married the sisters, Leah and Rachel, Jacob's family had now grown to 11 strapping boys. Number 12 is, will, will come a little later. And in keeping with what we already know about Jacob and his father-in-law, when Jacob decided to take his brood back to the land promised to his grandfather, Abraham and his father Isaac, of course, Laban and Jacob tried to cheat one another as he was about to leave northern Syria. But this time, Jacob came out on top and got the best of Laban. Some Jacobs never change. But you know, as soon as this mess sort of resolved itself and things were looking up, Jacob received some very disturbing news. You see, as he and his family were heading back to his homeland, he got word that his brother Esau was coming to meet him. And since he knew that he'd already cheated his brother out of his birthright, his inheritance, and his father's blessing, Jacob naturally assumed that Esau was looking to even the score. 
something that caused him to head off to Laban in the first place. And after failing to slow Esau down by sending him a whole mess of, of goats and camels and cows and donkeys, Jacob sort of braced for the worst. And I'll tell you, it was at this point Jacob encountered God in a special way. Just listen to what it says in Genesis. Jacob got up in the middle of the night and took his wives, his 11 children, and everything he owned across to the other side of the Jabbok River for safety. Afterwards, Jacob went back and spent the rest of the night alone. A man came and fought with Jacob until just before daybreak. When the man saw that he could not win, he struck Jacob on the head and hip and threw it out of joint. They kept on wrestling until the man said, let, me, let go of me, it's almost daylight. You can't, you can't go until you bless me, Jacob replied. Now, that's what happened. And you know, even though in the story his opponent was only called a man, I feel pretty comfortable saying that we're dealing with something divine here, whether an angel or maybe God himself. And I'll tell you, so did Jacob. I mean, a little later in the same story, Jacob said, I have seen God face to face and I am still alive. So he named the place Peniel, which means in Hebrew, face of God. You see, Jacob believed he'd encountered God on the other side of the Jabbok River. And as a result of that encounter, well, Jacob was changed. I mean, after demanding that the man bless him, just listen to what happened. Then the man asked, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. The man said, from now on your name will no longer be Jacob. You will be called Israel because you have wrestled with God and with men and you have won. Jacob said, now tell me your name. Don't you know who I am? He asked and he blessed Jacob. Jacob said, I have seen God face to face and I am still alive. So he named the place Peniel. The sun was coming up as Jacob was re leaving Peniel. He was limping because he had been struck on the hip. Now, that's what it says in Genesis. And I'll tell you, I think that's really important. You see, as a result of the, his encounter, Jacob was changed, wasn't he? In other words, he wasn't the same, kind, same person he used to be, you know, when he got up in the middle of the night and took his wives, his 11 children, and everything he owned across to the other side of the Jabbok River for safety. In fact, I think it was changed in two very profound ways. I mean, first, he felt he left the encounter with a new name, a new identity. Remember, after hearing that his name was Jacob, the man said, from now on your name will no longer be Jacob, you will be called Israel because you have wrestled with God and you have won. You see, from that time on, he was no longer going to be Jacob. You know, the heel, the schemer, the cheat. Instead, he was now Israel, the one who wrestled with God. And I'll tell you, that new name, that new identity would shape the rest of his life. <clears throat> you see, he would become the father to 12 sons who would become 12 tribes. And they would be known as the children of Israel, not the children of Jacob. And through that family, not only would God display his power, through him the Savior of humanity would be born. You see, right along with, with Moses and David and Samuel, Jesus would be one of Israel's children. I'm telling you, first, Jacob received a new identity. But second, as a result of his wrestling match with God, Jacob also faced a new reality. I mean, remember that in his encounter when the man saw that he could not win, he struck Jacob on the hip and threw it out of joint? Well, as a result, when the sun was coming up as Jacob was leaving Peniel, he was limping because he had been struck on the hip. In other words, because of the encounter, Jacob now had to deal with a new reality. I mean, before this, Jacob could really do whatever he pleased, right? And as we knew, know, what pleased Jacob didn't make the people around him all warm and fuzzy. My gosh, he stole from Esau, his brother, and he lied to Isaac, his father, and he cheated Laban, his father-in-law. And when things got hot and he needed to get the heck out of Dodge, he could always make a run for the border. But after this encounter, that changed. 
Now Israel was hobbled. His running days were over. And he'd have to start living a life befitting his new name. You see, his self-centered, self-serving, self-indulged, self-absorbed days were done. Now he'd have to rely on God. The one whose control Israel remembered every time he looked at his driver's license and felt the joint pain in his hip. I think I'm safe in saying that as a result of his encounter, Jacob's identity and reality changed and he knew it as he limped away. And I'll tell you, I think the same thing can be said about us. You see, like Jacob, we also encounter God. Now, don't get me wrong, I think God is close to us all the time. But having said that, I also believe there are times when we experience God in a special and powerful way. Of course, it can happen in all kinds of situations. For example, it could be at a summer camp or in a hospital room. It could happen during a sight and sound experience in Lancaster or after seeing a movie that really touches our hearts at the AMC in Clarion. Man, it might even happen during a sermon some Sunday during worship or, or Bible study on Wednesday morning or Thursday evening. But you know, the where and the how aren't that important. Like miracles, I believe encounters with God are more than possible. And I'm talking about those special times when God seems incredibly close. They happen. They happen to Jacob and they happen to us. But if you don't think this kind of thing has ever happened to you, don't worry. They don't need to be sought. God is always close. In fact, if you want to encounter God, just relax. Lower your defensive and feel his presence. But file this away, the fact that y'all are here this morning, I believe shows that you've experienced God, whether you realize it or not. We encounter God. But you know, again, having said this, I think it's important to understand that just like Jacob, when that happens, when this encounter occurs, man, we are changed. And like him, I believe we're changed in two ways. You see, because we've been touched and called by God, first, we've been given a new identity. Something that we celebrated when Corbin was baptized a little while ago. You see, that's what this sacrament is all about. In baptism, our identity is changed. And just like, and just think about what this identity change actually means. You see, it means that we're no longer people left to figure out who we are or where we're supposed to be or what we're expected to do. That's changed. Now we know that we are the children of God, the heirs of the promise, the brothers and sisters of Christ and one another. And now we know that we have a place. A family in which we are now members. A body in which we're given a special function. And we now know that we have a purpose, a focus, a reason to live. And I think that purpose is twofold. I mean, on one hand, we're certainly called to love. Remember when asked which law was most important, Jesus answered. The most important one says, people of Israel, you have only one Lord and God. You must love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second most important commandment says, love others as much as you love yourself. No other commandment is more important than these. You see, on one hand, we're, we've been called to love. But on the other hand, we're also called to share. Again, just listen to the last words Jesus spoke to his disciples according to Matthew. Jesus came to them and said, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Go to the people of all nations and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teach them to do everything I have told you. And I will be with you always, even until the end of the world. I'm telling you, just like it was for Jacob, when he became Israel, when we encounter God, our identity changes. That's one. And second, because of that, like Jacob, we also face a new reality. In other words, when we accept the encounter and answer the call, I'm telling you whether we like it or not, we're now forced to face a different kind of world. You see, even though it may not involve a limp, after we come face to face with God, everything changes. All of a sudden, some of the things in which we took so much pleasure, 
Well, they're just not nearly as fun anymore. And I'm talking, I'm not just talking about the stuff the world labels immoral and unethical. Good night, nurse. Some of those things that used to enhance our popularity and feed our ego. Man, we may have to give them up and let them go. Simply put, we're not going to be able to put ourselves at the center of the universe anymore. Because we're going to recognize that that's not where we belong. That place belongs to God. It's like James wrote in his letter to the 12 tribes scattered all over the world. Surrender to God. Resist the devil and he will run from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Clean up your act, you, your lives, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you people who can't make up your mind. Be sad and sorry and weep. Stop laughing and start crying. Be gloomy instead of glad. Be humble in the Lord's presence. And he will honor you. You see, the bottom line is this. When we recognize that we were loved before the foundation of the world, and when we recognize that we have been redeemed almost 2,000 years before we were born, and when we recognize that those two things only have meaning because God literally pried open our eyes and our minds and our hearts, you see, when we realize that, it's hard not to feel humble. I guess you could say that meeting God humbles our ego, hobbles our egos. And it's difficult to be cocky with a limp. I'll tell you, when we encounter God, our reality also changes, and that's too. Right now, even as we speak, Debbie and Maggie are heading back to Morgantown. And I'll be following right after the service. And outside of some phone calls and the miracle of FaceTime, I don't know whether I'll see her again until Thanksgiving. But even if she's not here, I know that I'm a different person now than when I was 21 years ago. Because she's been a part of my life. I've changed. But of course, I think every parent knows what I'm talking about. And I'll tell you, I think this is something Jacob learned when he encountered God and found that both his identity and reality had changed. And you know, I think the same can be said of us. You see, in a variety of ways, we've also encountered God. And through that encounter, our identity and our reality has, have also been changed. And this is something we can better understand because on the other side of the Jabbok River, after wrestling with God, Jacob becomes Israel. Amen. Well, thanks for listening. I hope you found the sermon meaningful. Of course, if on a Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, if you're ever around Sligo, Pennsylvania, again, that's about 10 miles south of Clarion, and Clarion's on Interstate 80, come on by Sligo Presbyterian Church and worship with us. We'd love to have you, and I think you'll have a, a meaningful time. Of course, if you're around Sligo on a, on a Wednesday morning at 10.30 or Thursday evening at 6.30, come on by the church and join us at a Bible study. I think you'll get a lot out of it. And so until I talk with you again, I want you to remember that you, my friends, you are a child of God, and God loves you very much. Goodbye for now.